I'll be starting uh, with uh, the second session, uh, which is uh, palliative care and pain. Uh, so uh, as uh, as we discussed, uh, um, like it will be based primarily from Harrison's, uh, but uh, 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 nevertheless, uh, we can't have this topic strictly restricted to Harrison's without uh, bringing in our uh, Indian scenario into perspective. Uh, so uh, today's session actually will be for those people who intend to practice clinical medicine in bedside, and uh, who interact with patients on a daily basis. So it's very important for you to know what palliative care means. If anyone actually you know, follows Harry Potter, they know this uh, um, uh, snitch that Harry Potter uh, you know, catches and it's engraved, I open at the close. So uh, these discussions about palliative care usually uh, in um, hindsight begin, with, begin during the end of a patient's life or when the nearing uh, uh, is uh, very apparent. So is that what palliative care is about? Uh, actually, it's not. Okay, so palliative care is all about uh, 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 decisions and uh, uh, the concepts of uh, care that begin as soon as the diagnosis is reached and not at the fair end when the patient's uh, uh, death is imminent. So that those kind of uh, talks which happen when the patient is in the fair end of his uh, uh, life is called as hospice care or uh, end of life care. So palliative care, now you need to understand from this uh, uh, lecture that palliative care actually begins from the time of diagnosis. Although it is very small in its component and it's very not that very apparent, it's important for you, for palliative care physicians, palliative care specialists and teams to pitch in and start the conversations about uh, um, continue, long-term continuing care. Uh, since this is a topic mostly uh, dealt uh, about uh, non-communicable chronic diseases, uh, we need to understand that certain diseases don't, uh, uh, you know, fall into the picture when we're talking about palliative care. Okay, palliative care uh, primarily starts with uh, relieving uh, relieving of suffering. That is mainly palliative care to understand. You no, know, for a basic understanding, palliative care is relief of suffering, be it in any form. Okay, and the most important suffering that we all know is pain. So pain and pain medicine is a part of palliative care. And so much so so much importance uh, has been given to pain that Harrison's actually tells that the fifth vital sign is pain itself. Okay, so uh, to begin with this session, we need to understand what uh, pain is. So, if you look at this uh, diagram, we'll come to the pathophysiology of pain directly. So there is something called as primary activation and secondary activation. Okay, so if you look at the first cardinal manifestation chapter, that is about pain, and the first one is primary activation and secondary activation. Okay, so this is not very apparent otherwise, so I'm, put, I'm stressing on it. So let us say there is a dent in the skin, okay, there's some issue, uh, tissue injury, so there's a dent there, and there's release of uh, uh, potassium and hydrogen from the dead tissues, prostaglandins, and bradykinins from the vessel wall. So this actually uh, ca causes irritation of the nerve terminals. These are free nerve endings, correct? Free nerve endings are basically receptors. Their nerve receptors are also called as nociceptors. So these nociceptors are getting activated by uh, potassium and uh, hydrogen, prostaglandins, and uh, um, bradykinin. These are all inflammatory mediators. Okay, once uh, uh, the tissue injury has stopped, or once the inciting uh, event has stopped, then there is no more problem in the overlying skin, correct? But the pain still pers persists. This is subacute or chronic pain or pain that is inadequately treated, this happens not because of the tissues that are dying, but is because of the receptor itself. And this is called as nociceptor induced inflammation. Okay. So nociceptor induced inflammation. Okay. So which is the nociceptor? The nociceptor is the free nerve terminals, these yellow nerves. These are the nociceptors. And see, nociceptors are actually releasing substance P. Nociceptors are releasing substance P. So these, this substance P is very specific that is released by nociceptors either in the peripheral nerves or in spinal cord or centrally in the brain. So these substance P actually incites a production of histamine from mast cell and uh, uh, um, serotonin from platelets. And this, this happens after the tissue injury has subsided. And this if it occurs repeatedly, repeatedly and repeatedly, if it keeps occurring without any trigger, this is almost like chronic pain, okay? And to deplete the patient of pain, we need to understand both the primary activation and secondary activation. Because what is our current general understanding is of pain is this. So we go ahead, we stop uh, all these uh, uh, mediators by giving drugs and we think the pain will come down. But half and majority, more than half of the patients with chronic pain won't get re relieved because we are not treating secondary activation. So secondary activation also needs to be treated. 
not just the dying tissues okay and not just the trigger but the nociceptor also so nociceptor induced inflammation is by substance p and is very important what is pain a very simple opening definition for first five years of mbbs if anybody asks you what is pain it is very difficult to understand because not clearly mentioned anywhere there is an international association for study of pain okay society of pain iasp this was last uh, uh, you know um, modified in uh, somewhere around 1980s but now they have revised it okay so you can see the revised definition of pain uh, so the revised definition of pain is basically an unpleasant one second i'll just an unpleasant sensory or an emotional experience that is associated with potential or tissue actual tissue damage okay so you forget about the yellow highlight part just look at it so it's an unpleasant sensory or an emotional experience that is associated with actual or potential tissue damage so two keywords actual and potential let, what is the meaning of actual and potential so let us say there is heat okay so you go near the stove you put your hand near the uh, flame that heat radiation itself is potential tissue damage okay it has not reached your skin and causing damage or burns yet but it is potential tissue damage so that is heat so this is called as potential tissue damage if this heat if this flame on the stove if you go on keeping your hand near it it might cause primary secondary burns or whatever it is so burns so the burn on the skin due to heat is the actual tissue damage so this is potential tissue damage this is actual tissue damage so these two are basically the parts of the definition then what is this resembling that associated with so this is a very important keyword that is for those patients who have already been sensitized to it let us say you have an army official who has fought in a war he's suffering from ptsd even the mention of something like a fight mention of some bomb blast a mention of uh, you know a large you know a hearing a large explosion itself is enough to trigger pain and pain mediators he's going to suffer for a very long time so that even that information of about pain in sensitized individuals is actually enough to cause pain so that's why the word resembling with is used here that resembling with is for those patients with chronic pain who have been sensitized uh, repeatedly so sensitization happens because of secondary activation repeated uh, cycles of nociceptor induced inflammation will lead to sensitization so sensitization is the key to understanding chronic pain so like i've been telling you that palliative care is about relief of this entire pain not just the primary activation but the secondary activation as well look forget about the upper part look at the lower uh, figure wherein you see diagnosis has been done at the diagnosis itself your pa early palliative care will start and it goes on becoming more at the end when the patient is about to, has multiple decompensations and has died you have a lot of palliative care involvement and that part of palliative care is called as hospice care hospice care it can be a home based or an institutional care so palliative care begins from uh, the diagnosis it is not just telling that the patient is going to die it is about understanding the patient's social situation financial situations helping him actually uh, tied through accept the diagnosis and tied through the treatment that is the understanding for example let us say you have a patient who has now newly been diagnosed with ckd you are only giving the diagnosis of ckd what is the general what generally happens is you give the diagnosis of ckd you give the treatment plan and then you move on to the next patient that is that is inevitable because we have a lot of patients the doctor patient uh, ratio is very very uh, low so you don't have time to explain and understand their situations you are not able to uh, rehearse your own uh, uh, you know um, uh, uh, methodology and treatment plan so in that time we need pe people who are able to talk give a sufficient amount of time and ensure that they have understood so it's all about talk you might think that talking to patients and explaining to the condition is just about you delivering uh, all your treatment plans and then running away you can't do that so at this point of time you need to understand that there is a methodology that is in place for you to break bad news give a new diagnosis and take them through the process and understand whether they be able to adhere to the treatment and able to see the any side effects and then ensure that they have any other questions to me okay so a palliative care physician or any physician in general needs to understand something called as the p spikes protocol so p spikes protocol is basically how you give a bad news to somebody it just need not be bad news it can be any diagnostic uh, information that you are giving to the patient that is new to him 
you don't know what is his financial status you don't know his educational qualification you can't tell okay you have leukemia it's a blood cancer you need treatment it's radiation you need bone marrow transplant and then go away you can't do that so here we are expected to follow a methodological uh, uh, um, stepwise uh, procedure through which we break the news and uh, we ensure that the patient's understood it and then he's able to uh, uh, you know with, withhold the treatment that is coming with the diagnosis now we have a lot of in indian palliative care uh, uh, organizations there are many but i'm just telling the ones that are very old uh, pallium which is in mainly in kerala and trivandrum and the can support that is mostly in the north indian uh, states uh, are few of the palliative organizations that, spe that they specialize only in palliative uh, medicine uh, until recently we didn't have any policy or national policy but now the national health mission also uh, has started a uh, national program for palliative care um, um, that helps in policy making mainly but at the grassroots level it is us the doctors nurses and the paramedical personnel who are involved in uh, healthcare that needs to understand this entire concept of palliation so who uh, says palliative care improves the quality of life of patients okay if you go on prolonging the treatment look at this how much of life prolonging care is there here okay it might be important at this this stage but once you know that the diagnosis and treatment you know that the treatment is uh, very minimal there is no point of giving unnecessary treatment and unnecessary investigations just to burden the patients and go on you know prolonging your uh, prolonging the patient's life you need to see what life you are going to prolong if you are able to improve the quality of life then fine otherwise it's bet better to withhold the treatment only after you have spoken to the uh, family members and the patient himself otherwise you have to follow us your own protocols that are in place so palliative care improves the quality of life of patients and the families who are facing challenges associated with life threatening illnesses whether it's physical it's psychological social or spiritual if you have a patient with psoriasis who is young you will know how much stigma he has from going outside he does not even go outside he changes his job he do, he does not meet he does not go to family function it changes the entire treatment and entire uh, perspective about that patient's life so social and spiritual modes also have to be connected the quality of the caregivers improves as well what does this mean what who's a caregiver the daughter in law who's taking care of the ailing father in law the daughter who's taking care of the mother so these people who are inside the home taking care who are not from the medical personal as uh, generally not from a medical medical background are called as caregivers okay caregiver burden also has to be considered you cannot go on making them you know spend their entire day and time and life in caring for the elderly or for the sick you need to give them some amount of gap also okay so um we understood that we need to prolong life but only in prolong quality life so those treatments or investigations which don't help in uh, improving the quality of life is called as a futile treatment and this concept is called as medical futility so medical futility in harrisons is one and one and a half pages but at the end you need to understand that how much are you willing to go and stop certain treatments and investigations because you know that they are not going to help the patient or the quality of life of the patient okay so this was a taiwanese study in an icu the icu doctors were interrogated okay they were asked how many uh, how many doctors how, how how much how often do you actually give treatments or give investigations to a patient just to safeguard yourself from uh, legal uh, um, you know uh, suing and uh, you know lawsuits so if you look at this 7.3% said always they're always giving unnecessary treatment and unnecessary investigations that are in the book just to save themselves from going into the court and 46.3% told often so almost more than half of them actually are giving treatments and investigations that are unnecessary but not because they want to mint money or they want to make money but at times when the patient's attenders a patient's family actually file a lawsuit it will help them in moving through it they will win it and they can come out uh, not uh, facing heavy burden so this is called as medical futility now i don't know how i'll not i'm not in a position to understand or comment about whether it should be done or not done so what is a uh, quantitative or qualitative futility so quantitative futility is the investigation that you give or the treatment you give then doubtfulness of the investigation itself is called as quantitative futility in in qualitative futility the investigation effect on the patient that you are having in the icu is doubtful see that investigation might be helpful for me or a young person anybody but an aging cancer patient in the icu with severe comorbidities whether that investigation is going to help him 
is called as qualitative futility whereas quantitative futility is the doubtful nature of the investigation itself it's so rare it might not work on anybody so that is called as quantitative futility so both these things are futile treatments so futile treatments are those treatments which which might not uh, uh, work or improve the quality of life in uh, in these patients okay so these patients you know in the hospital they end up dying they end up dying in their homes they end up dying in hospice care it, hospice is even till date it's even unheard of in india but what is the site of death if you uh, if you look at uh, harrison's uh, uh, graph you look at how many people have been uh, dying at uh, ho- dying in the hospital dying at homes and dying in hospice care if this is a, definitely a us uh, data but if you look in the x axis it's the year it's the time and this is the number of deaths okay so if you can see the blue one those are the number of people who are dying at home okay and the red one is inpatient so people who are dying in hospitals not in hospice in hospitals have declined that is to show the rising trend of hospice care and good palliative uh, 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 you know discussions that have led to certain chronic diseases being treated at home and these patients have been actually dying at home with dignity they have been actually with their family members and they have uh, you know ha- they have died peacefully that is what we need to uh, you know start talking to patients and family members how do we de- we we deal with life with so much of dignity we should be able to uh, deal with death also with dignity although it's a sad process we can't give so much of treatments intubations and cprs and unnecessarily prolong you know give them like five more days to live that does not make any sense okay so you need to have certain people to talk to when these patients become very sick or they become mentally ill or they're not able to consent anymore so these people are called as proxy so you have a, a family member or someone that the uh, patient has appointed to ha- make all the decisions about their medical uh, um, medical uh, decisions uh, so that they have a ease of uh, you know moving through the uh, decision uh, making uh, plan and these certain directives certain decision making points that are given are called as advanced care directives okay so advanced care directives are, are like a it's like a medical will it's like do not resuscitate or do not intubate or do not give certain treatments or do not give transfusions these are advanced care directives that are already in place when the patient is already uh, you know uh, completely coherent and uh, is given consent okay so it is not just the patient who needs to be relieved of suffering palliation should not be only for the patient himself look at the pe- people around him i'm pretty sure when someone is listening to this lecture and you have an ailing uh, grandfather or grandmother or you have somebody who is very much sick in your house and you have a lot of people who are uh, you know um, helping him and a lot of people who are under stress because of this entire event itself although they are like totally in into helping it they they definitely find some amount of stress now how much stress is supposed to be given to them and how much stress is not supposed to be given to them is is, is something called as respite care okay so respite care is the care given to the caregivers okay and to reduce the caregivers burden so basically respite care they can be physicians or nurses who come into your house they spend some time okay and they give breaks for the caregivers they let them go to a vacation or some house or something like that and then this take away the burden for some time and this happens periodically so this enhances the amount of uh, um, care that the caregivers also give and they can help lead their life also respectfully okay so that is called as respite care now palliative care can be given at home it can be given community based for example in kerala you have a neighborhood network of palliative care it happens in a community itself okay and then um, what happens during the last hours what about the palliation in the last hours the last hours are actually the dying period okay so it's extremely crucial that any physician who is taking care of a very sick ill patient you have you can be a family physician physician for somebody you know that that patient is like actually uh, you know there's not much anything you can do he might be having a very very bad lung uh, who's on chronic oxygen therapy he can be a cancer patient he can be have mets or anything like that so he actually the family should already been uh, you know prime that okay you know death is nearing you need to inform them that these are the things that are going to happen and you need to inform them specific things you can't like generally tell okay death is going to like be soon and then go away you have to tell them specific things so that they don't get alerted and then they call uh, uh, the ambulance and the ambulance person starts coming in and he gives the cpr they intubate the patient in the hospital and then that's the whole thing is futile okay you don't want that that's troublesome for everybody including the patient and we still follow passive euthanasia in india and elsewhere okay we don't follow active euthanasia we withhold treatments after consent and legal 
uh, uh, legal, after legal uh, nature has been subsided, we always take consent and then we follow the advanced care directives. Okay. So you inform the patient well before that this is might going to happen. And the most important thing that they talk about is the patient is not eating. That's why he is not, he's dying. So this is a point of contention where it's very difficult for you to explain at that point of time that the patient is not uh, uh, dying because he's not eating. He's dying and that's why he's not eating. That's a very important difference that you need to understand. So this has to be made clear to them prior. Okay. There might be pent up secretions in the mouth. He's always lying flat. It might gurgle. That is called as a death rattle. So that gurgling, they, what they do, they try to put something into the mouth. They try to put a, uh, they, they a suction that causes asphyxiation. That versus the entire thing. So that shouldn't be done. Just change the position. They start feed, force feeding the patient. They start giving water. That shouldn't be done. So that, that is what we need to know. So these specific important details have to be known uh, before uh, you know delving into treating any patient who's a chronic geriatric patient or any patient who's having a chronic uh, uh, disease. Um, there are three tiers of palliative care. One is primary palliative care, which is delivered by all of us, general physicians, physicians, people who are not from the palliative care background. Secondary uh, uh, palliation and tertiary palliation is actually a little confusing. Tertiary uh, palliative cares are palliative care teams. Okay, They include a lot of people from palliative care, from pain medicine, anesthesia, general medicine, a lot of people who are the primary care physician, the family physician, everybody comes into play. Secondary palliation is the palliative uh, is the specialist who's treating only. He's not the palliative care specialist. He's just a specialist who's treating. That needs to be understood. Okay. So we've understood the whole gist about what relief of suffering is. And we've obviously understood the importance of the second diagram, which is very, very important. Okay. Here the nerve terminals are increasing the substance P, which causes mast cells and platelets to release certain mediators that incites the activation of action potentials in the nerve without any inciting trigger. That is, that is called as secondary activation. If it happens repeatedly, you know, these inflammatory medias are repeatedly there, okay, in primary and secondary, the nerve terminal gets sensitized and that leads to um, uh, something called as allodynia. Okay, so what even without the minor stimuli, the nerve terminal gets activated. So you don't need full 100 kg effort to cause pain. You need just one gram of effort to cause pain. That is called as allodynia. Okay, now if you can see this entire uh, clipet from Harrison's, a large proportion of A delta and C fibers innovating viscera. I mean, we're talking about viscera, okay? They're completely insensitive in normal, non-injured, non-inflamed tissue. So generally, your internal organs, they don't, uh, they, in a non-injured state, they, they're completely insensitive to pain. But when do they become painful? Okay, you have stomach ache, you have, a, you have a, a, an abscess, it starts hurting. Why does it hurt? That happens because of something called a sensitization. This is what I've told about. Sensitization is low pH, prostaglandins, leukotrienes, other inflammatory mediators, which are going to uh, stimulate the nerve endings without any or with very minimal stimuli. That is called a sensitization. So an inflamed, injured or distended organ can only cause pain. Otherwise, it cannot cause pain. That is very important to understand the important sens sensitization in visceral pain. If you look at this graph, which uh, plots stimulus intensity with pain intensity, let us say I have given you uh, X amount of stimulus. I've given you X amount of stimulus. The amount of pain that it gives me is Y, correct? In sensitization, this stimulus intensity is low. It's X by 2. Okay. For the same amount of stimulus intensity, you have the pain intensity remains the same. The same intensity of the pain perceived is same in allodynia. Okay, this is what this is point number one. In point number two is hyperalgesia. Point number two is hyperalgesia, where you are going to give okay, the pain intensity increases. That is the understanding. You're going to give a stimulus intensity, I'll say x by 1.5, or irrespective of the stimulus intensity, for the same stimulus intensity, also, if you give the pain intensity is higher. Okay, he perceives pain to be very high, even for a normally painful stimulus. That is called as hyperalgesia. So hyperalgesia and allodynia. These are two important concepts. The difference, the key to the difference is the pain perception. If the pain perception is same for a very low stimulus or with the standard stimulus, that is called as allodynia. If the pain perception is too high for a standard stimulus, that is called as hyperalgesia. So these are two important key differences that you need to understand. Like I told you, they can be ATP, serotonin, bradykinin, histamine that are released from the tissue.
those that can stimulate the nerve endings. And one important is TRP, uh, uh, TRPV1. Uh, so T, uh, this is called a venyloid receptor, which is also involved in mediation of pain. I've already talked about sensitization. All these processes are um, going to increase the sensitivity of the nerve terminals to even small amount of pain. Okay. Now here we come are the specific details. So here, this is the heart of the slide, wherein we need to know what palliative specific care options are present. Okay. So you, uh, let's not talk general. We're going to talk about what palliative treatments can be given, end of life treatment can be given for certain symptoms. Let us say first you have dyspnea. Okay. So certain treatments like, you know, you will give oxygen, you will give diuretics, you're going to give, I know, I, I know, I, I know tropes to relieve dyspnea, but that's not what we're talking about here. Look, Treatments such as handheld fan, blowing air, seating the patient next to a window, you know, putting him to a place where there's ample amount of uh, uh, air exchanges is going to help alleviate the dyspnea. That is palliative care. And th this is not done for so many patients, even if told. They think that these are not important treatments or physicians are not stressing upon these things, which are more important and which makes more sense to somebody else. There is a whole TEDx talk on somebody who has lost his leg and now who is a palliative care physician. He tells that he has given uh, authority to for one of his patients to smoke cigars, even if he is having uh, end of uh, you know end of you know end stage lung cancer. You know, with lung cancer end stage, you're not even going to have so much amount of time. What? Why is he? Why has he given that permission to smoke cigar? Because that's just going to make the patient happy, and making happy is relief of suffering. That's what we need to intend to do over here. We are we, we need to deviate a little bit from the median. And go and say, okay, this is probably the human aspect and not the physician or the scientific methods that are doing. These are not scientific methods, let us say. These are not explained by uh, the, uh, no distinct pathophysiological mechanisms, but they work. And that's what we need. We don't need explanations over here. We need things that work and relieve the suffering of patients. So things like that. Like, let us say, in Harrison's, he mentioned these three things to cause pain. Only these three things, which cause a lot of pain. Everything else causes pain, but these three things are mentioned as the most important things that cause pain. Heart failure, cancer, and AIDS. Okay. Patient controlled analgesia, morphine prescriptions, and air mattresses. Now, I told you I won't talk about drugs, but I've talked about drugs. Why? Morphine prescription, although it's a drug, it's a drug that is underused. I'm telling you, it is underused. Everyone who's listening to this lecture needs to understand one thing morphine's sedative dose is too high compared to its analgesic dose. Its respiratory sedative dose is too high compared to its analgesic dose. You need to give a lot of morphine. You need to give frequent morphine to a patient who deserves morphine. Okay. So if he's actually uh, prescribed morphine, please give proper amount of morphine to relieve him and cut him off of all pain. That is primary objective of palliation. You can't expect him to await pain. Don't await pain and then give. The last session we had was about fever. In fever, I told, don't uh, you know wait for fever to come. Just give the drug, give paracetamol well within time. So that the fever never, uh, you know, fever, when it comes, you take, you record the temperature and then take paracetamol so that we know how frequently it's coming, how badly it's coming. But that's not the case with palliation. This is completely opposite. And that's how dynamic this concept is. So in palliation, you don't have, don't let the patient even wait. Don't let the patient wait and experience pain or document pain. We don't need that. You give morphine and you document at a later stage. Let, let's say you document weekly or monthly. Okay, there are documentations, but it's not as rigorous as what we talked about in the previous session. So liberal opioid usage is the key. It's mentioned everywhere. You open the books today also. If you go back to Harrison's, you will see liberal usage and patients, uh, physicians being scared of giving morphine. So I'm, I'm highlighting the amount of morphine that you need to give or the amount of opioids that you need to give has to be liberal and tailored to the patient's needs. And only when it crosses a certain point or point dose, then you will go for monitoring and uh, careful treatments. You have bony meds, let us say. You give bisphosphonates and radiation therapy to that bony meds, okay? Lot of your grandfathers and grandmothers who are like above the age of what they could survive, they're all actually confused at one point or the other. Why are they confused? There could be a lot of medical reasons. We're not here to discuss that. We are here to discuss what are the simple things that we can do to avoid confusion. You have kept them in a room because they can't go outside, let us understand. Okay, but they have totally lost touch of what, when is the day and when is the night? Okay, so this light and day entrainment is very important. They need to be uh, reintroduced to circadian rhythm by using certain, you know, outdoor walks or just seating them next to a window in the room or giving them circadian smart lights that are present, you know, that they change the uh, color uh, of the bulb according to the day and night, putting large clocks, 
come and keep talking to uh, talking to them and reminding them what they ate in the afternoon what they ate in the morning this is very important for them to entrain themselves to reduce delirium and if you reduce delirium a lot of their problems actually get solved they keep suffering inside which is very bad you can see a lot of these patients having dry tongue flaky lips even in icu you see people will be there with dry tongues and flaky lips nobody will do anything very important for you to go and give mouth care with chlorhexidine damp the entire area with water please don't pour water inside don't give iv fluids you don't know what their heart condition is what their renal condition is more often than not it will be actually a contraindication so don't give iv fluids just damp and clean the area give artificial tears to lubricate the eyes and so on more than dysphagia these people something called like you know almost have aphasia i don't even know if it's there or not but if they can't even swallow they won't even attempt to swallow right they're not able to swallow is because they're almost nearing the end of life so don't force feed them there's no point don't force feed them give essential medicines that you have to using other roots give i give iv im or give subcutaneous or rectal root or buccal root or anything like that please don't give uh, don't, don't force feed them okay i have already told you about death rattling death rattling is basically a lot of pent up secretions in the mouth and you need to you know dry them up either you give scopolamine patches every 3 days two patches every 3 days and no force feeding or suctioning that can cause asphyxiation locomotion those who are able to move how do you improve their locomotion you know they're not you need to have railings on the stairs you need to have well lit environments you need to correct the spectacles you need to periodically get them checked if there's cataract relieve them of cataract if they need hearing aid get them tested get a pta done and get them get hearing aids these are very very important things that will improve locomotion and they prevent falls basically okay and this opioid induced constipation the very important topic for today is because whenever you give opioids uh, th opioid therapy for patients we what we call it as cot therapy cot is chronic opioid therapy so when you give chronic opioid therapy they always always have constipation once you go above few days of opioid therapy they will invariably have constipation again don't wait for constipation to happen the best treatment is prevention here so you end up treating it okay so you uh, give a combination of a stool softener with laxative you can't give more fluids orally you can't give fibers because they are going to pull out more fluids so fiber is never a therapy in opioid okay opioid induced constipation you're going to give a combination of laxative plus a stool softener so this table actually summarizes uh, and uh, you know uh, all the palliative care specific options that are there and this is very important for one to read and remember and apply okay these are not these are things that are underused okay like i told you um this is a snippet from uh, uh, harrisons which tells opioid side effects should be anticipated and treated preemptively okay so the preferred treatment is prevention that is what you have to remember stool softener plus laxatives now coming to the uh, uh, pathophysiology of pain which we already know you you are going to have a tissue injury release of prostaglandins nociceptor activation and it can cause acute pain that is because of primary hyperalgesia that is acute pain okay the nociceptors is activated here now intense and prolonged noxious transmission it goes on again and again and again and again what happens is in the uh, center we are going to have nmd activation and increase in calcium uptake so this nmd activation and calcium uptake is going to cause some amount of plasticity and that it will lead to sensitization of the pain that is called a central sensitization so no matter what you do with uh, paracetamol to this cox this part is untouched that will continue to cause pain so that is the pain that we need to that we intend to uh, treat this is almost like neuropathic pain where the pain pathways are affected this leads to upregulation of nitric oxide synthesis sulfatase ox sulfite oxide uh, sulfite oxide nitric oxide and pge so this leads to upregulation of these substances causing remodeling and plasticity so in secondary activation and central sensitization it is the nmda plus the calcium flux increasing this is very important that leads to sulfite oxide and nitric oxide increasing so this is very important these are the mediators for chronic pain and sensitized pain okay now what is referred pain so referred pain is basically let us say you have this is where pain converges correct in the spinal cord so you have let us say a viscera stomach and bowel where some problem is happening some perforation and distension or obstruction is there this nerve terminals from the viscera end up in the spinal cord and from from the spinal cord the same uh, to the same dermatome of the skin the nerve one more nerve terminal goes so if you are having a visceral problem you can distend it if it if it gets distended how to relieve this pain you can't go inside the organ and you know cure it right 
So to the same dermatome of the viscera, you irritate, you go and purposefully irritate the skin using ruby patients, uh, you know, some kind of balms or uh, um, just pain, acupuncture, etc. If you irritate this skin to the same dermatome, this spinal cord also is, uh, you know, central to. So this spinal cord will get converged uh, signals from these two areas. So the visceral pain now gets suppressed because there's more pain in the skin. So we leave some time for the viscera to heal by continuously irritating the skin where we know nothing major will happen. So we leave time for viscera to heal. Once viscera is healed, then we stop this pain and there's no more pain from either side. So this is the idea of convergence projection, convergence projection hypothesis. This is very important for one to understand. So this is secondary activation with substance we have already told you. All this I've told you, nociceptors and pain, nociceptive pain is from substance P, CGRP, cholecystokinin. We talk mainly about substance P, but they can also release CGRP and cholecystokinin. Cholecystokinin and CGRP, which are two things that might, you, one might not remember putting it in this uh, picture. They are relieved from the, uh, they're released from the peripheral terminals, okay, when they're activated, okay. Now, in the spinal cord, we saw that all the nerves converge, right? And there are a lot of inhibitory interneurons also. The major transmitter that is released and uh, responsible for these events is glutamate. So glutamate is in the spinal cord. Okay. That one has to remember. These uh, spinal cord uh, neurons will excite the second order neurons, which go up the spinal cord into the thalamus and the uh, cognitive centers in the uh, cortex. So this is what it is. So there's an injury. So it goes crosses to the opposite side, ascends up two segments using the Lysaeus tract ascends in the lateral spinal thalamic tract and the anterior spinal thalamic tract. And all these are, mind you, A delta and C fibers, correct? Okay. They ascend up, they reach the thalamus, VPM or VPL, depending upon whether it's from the body or the face. And then it goes to the frontal cortex and the somatosensory cortex, where the pain is perceived, analyzed, and told what kind of pain is this, okay? And then in this diagram, you have uh, basically a, a pain modulation. So what is pain modulation? Pain modulation is when the tracks come from up to down. Okay. So the neurons start from the cortex over here. They uh, come from hypothalamus and from the major cortex. They, uh, uh, they relay in the reticular activating system and then they come down. Here in the reticular activating system, it will awake any sleeping patient. So let us say a sleeping patient was injured over here. The pain goes up, stimulates the cortex. Cortex then sends down the impulse to reticular act activating system. And then reticular activating system will awaken the patient. Okay, that's what is important. Then it descends down and influences the interneuron, inhibitory interneuron. Okay, it's given in black. So what the hypothalamus and the cortex influences is the inhibitory interneuron. And whatever happens down in the spinal cord over here, here in this junction is glutamate. Okay, so glutamate is very important for you in the spinal cord area. So this is what we have talked about till now and we summarized it. Acute pain, the mediator is prostaglandins. That's why we use the COX inhibitor such as paracetamol or aspirin or NSAIDs. Um, then we have chronic pain it's due to NMD and calcium influx, nitric oxide and sulfite oxide upregulation with sens central sen sensitization. This is the most uh, un uh, not talked about uh, mediators and they're not, uh, not many drugs are there to actually, uh, you know, suppress it. And primary activation is H plus, K plus, prostaglandins and bradykinins from the tissues. Mind you, from the tissues. Where a, where a secondary activation is called as nociceptor induced inflammation, NII. Okay. So this is substance P. It's from the nerve. It's not from the tissues. It's from the nerve and the receptor itself. And the central in the spinal cord, you have glutamine. So these are the different mediators for different parts of pain transmission. Till now, we spoke about this pain. Correct. This is a Harrison diagram. Again, like, let us say, let us dissect it out properly. You have mild pain, moderate pain, severe pain. So these are grades of pain. And how many can you see? One, two, and three. You have only three, correct? Please remember that there are three over here. But now it has changed. I'll tell you why it has changed in WHO. It is now four, okay? So mild, moderate, severe, three are there. When you are, when you are, when any physician is dealing with even moderate pain, okay, he has to classify whether it is nociceptive or neuropathic pain. What we talked about till now is nociceptive pain, okay? When the tissues are getting... Uh, damage. Neuropathic pain is the pain that happens in the spinal transmission. Okay. It's from the spinal cord, in inhibitory neurons, up to the thalamus, up to the cortex. Anywhere in the transmission pathway, if you're having a problem, that leads to neuropathic pain and extremely uh, 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 difficult to treat. Okay. And long lasting. Now, 
we learnt about allodynia we learnt about hyperalgesia now what is hyperpathia now in neuropathic pain which is actually a classic example for hyperpathia look it is a greatly exaggerated pain response okay pain perception is very high to innocuous or mild nociceptive stimuli it's a nociceptive stimuli that's the key here the stimuli is not neuropathic okay, the stimuli is a tissue injury itself but the exaggerated pain response is happening because of transmission problems and that is called as neuropathic pain okay neuropathic pain when a uh, tissue injury or a small amount of uh, stimuli is happening repeatedly okay repeated small stimuli which is nociceptive itself happens the pain perception is very high and that is called as neuropathic pain okay a types of neuropathic pain we'll discuss it in the next session but i want you to remember few types of neuropathic pain your diabetic neuropathy is neuropathic pain crps is called as chronic uh, regional pain syndrome so you have type 1 and type 2 post a fracture or a, you know major trauma if you're having a sympathetic uh, uh, sympathetic nerve dysfunction that is called as crps type 1 okay if there is no apparent uh, nerve injury that is called as crps type 2 as of now you remember this and remember that this is called a sympathetically mediated pain it's a very uh, specific term that is used it is called a sympathetically mediated pain which is a part of neuropathic pain so neuropathic pain happens for in during transmission of pain and the hyperpathia uh, is a classical feature of neuropathic pain okay it need not happen in every case of neuropathic pain but hyperpathia means when there is a repeated small amount of nociceptive stimuli, the pain that the patient perceives is extremely large. Okay. That is called as hyperpathia. Okay. It happens classically in transmission, pain transmission pathway lesions. And one of the important examples is CRPS1 and CRPS2. CRPS2 is also called as causalgia. Causalgia. Okay. So this is very important. We'll discuss about these two pains in detail later, but remember that they're also called as sympathetically mediated pain. I'll just write it here. It is called a sympathetically mediated pain. That is because it is mediated by sympathetic nerves mostly. Because of this, a lot of autonomic uh, problems will be there in the, the, the arm or the part that is affected. Let us say I have a fracture here. Months later, I'll have swelling, redness, itching, pain, burning, everything. The swelling, pain, itching, burning and all is happening because of pseudomotor and vasomotor uh, dysfunction. That happens because of sympathetic nerves. So that is called as causalgia. It's, it's called causalgia when there is no obvious nerve injury, whereas in CRPS type 1, when there is an obvious nerve injury because of various reasons. Okay. Now we come to the last part, which is the treatment. So I hope uh, everybody is understood till now. You can go back and rewind the video if you have not understood. So treatment here, I told you about this slide, which had three mild pain, moderate pain and severe pain okay once you anyone is dealing with a moderate pain they start classifying and treating once there's severe pain they start using opioids let us say briefly once they are not able to get rid of the pain that time also then they go to a specialist consultation right now if you look at the who step ladder treatment they've updated it from 1900s now 1900s there were only three now there are four you have mild pain mod, mild to moderate pain moderate to severe pain severe to very severe pain so step ladder consists of four ladders and we go on to give treatment uh, with respect to the uh, assignment of the ladder. So first you have a non-opioid plus adjuvant therapy. Then you give a weak opioid or a multimodal treatment. Okay. Then you give a strong opioid with a non-opioid. Then you give interventional treatments. Okay. Non-opioid treatments are basically your normal NSAIDs. Okay. They're, they can be basically non-narcotic treatments only. Weak opioids or multimodal treatments, then strong opioids with a non-opioid, and then you give interventional treatment with a non-opioid, and you remove opioids from here. In step ladder four, fourth ladder, you don't have opioids. Okay, that's what is mentioned over here. But there is a small disagreement over here. So should we start with weak opioids and then slowly increase the dose and go to strong opioids if the patient doesn't improve? Or should we start with a low dose strong opioids and keep increasing the dose of strong opioids? The answer is, if, 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 if people are like able to understand the question, if, should you start off the patient with weak doses of uh, weak opioids and good amount of doses of those opioids and then slowly progress to strong opioids? Or should you start with low doses of strong opioids itself? The answer is strong opioids. You don't consider weak opioids. According to treatment in COT, what is COT therapy? I've already told you COT therapy is chronic opioid therapy. Okay. So in COT therapy, basically you'd start with strong opioids, low dose, and then you increase the dose. 
you don't start with weak opioid because we know that weak opioids might not work at certain times and the, this whole topic is about a relief of suffering right so it, it, it might not relief of suffering it will just wait you need to keep waiting for a very long period of time then the patient you lose the patient then you might lose the patient to the disease or you might lose the patient to another doctor so that's one thing okay if you look at these important drugs over here few of them need to be you know, told properly this is aspirin acetyl salicylic acid 650 mg four thoroughly entry coated because they can cause a lot of gi effects then you have uh, naproxen this is anti inflammatory 250 to 500 mg bd and it causes somewhat high incidence of gastric bleeding that is what is important naproxen test we spoke about it in the last session wherein you give the test you give the drug for a trial to see if it's an inflammatory cause of fever so that's very important it's an anti inflammatory drug similar to indomethacin phenoprofen these are all anti inflammatory drugs Ketorolac is a very common parenteral uh, anti-inflammatory drug that is given in 15 to 60 mg IV or IM and it's a very, very strong uh, NSAID actually. Okay, so people need to remember that these exist in our uh, in our country and we need to use them properly. Valdecoxib is not available. Selecoxib is available. This is predominantly used in you know, ortho and rheumatology for treatment of arthritis. When the patient actually, you don't want to use uh, COX, uh, both COX-1 and COX-2, you want to use selectively COX-2 inhibitors only. Okay, but they have problems of their own also. These are certain non-narcotics. Okay, now, if you are going to a patient whom you are treating for a very long time with COT therapy, you move from oral therapy or IV therapy to transdermal patches. Okay, you give fentanyl and buprenorphine patches, which actually, uh, you know, they go up to steady plasma levels. Okay, which give a lot of comfort to the patient and they don't cause any side effects. Okay, that's why you give transdermal patches. So it's very important and you give fentanyl and buprenorphine transdermal patches, it's better than oral. That is what is important. Once your patient is having opioid induced constipation, you give peripherally acting opioid antagonists, alvimopan and methyl natrexone. Okay, alvimopan and methyl natrexone. These are peripherally restricted to GIT itself. They don't even get absorbed from the GIT. Okay, so they restrain themselves into the GIT. They help in opioid induced constipation, especially. Okay, and they increase the activity of uh, uh, the GIT. It's also used in post operative ileus. Okay, sometimes to increase it. So they don't have any, they don't penetrate the CNS. Okay, so they don't have the addictive effects that others usually might have. Now, this is a very, very important, important statement. Okay, now opioid and COX inhibitors both have additive analgesics effect. Okay, their analgesics effect actually add up, but their side effects need not add up. Okay, so the, the if you're having a patient with a lot of side effects of only opioid therapy in COT therapy, when you're giving COT, uh, if you're using a large dose of opioid, you can introduce a non opioid to reduce the dose of opioid. Okay, so when you reduce the dose of opioid, the side effects will come down. So the analgesics effect of opioid plus non-opioids are additive, whereas the analgesic, uh, whereas the side effects are not additive. Side effects actually come down. It's very, very important for you to know this. These are some painful conditions in response to TCAs. Why do we use TCAs? TCAs, SSRI, SNRI are very important and certain anti-epileptics. Okay, anti-epileptic, these are used for treatment of neuropathic pain. Okay, because they act on the pain transmission pathways. Okay, these prevent hyperpathia. Okay, very important is SSRI is because TCAs are having a lot of side effects. They have a lot of anticholinergic effects. So we use SSRI. So they are very classically used in post herpetic neuralgia. They affect the dorsal root ganglia, diabetic neuropathy. They affect the peripheral nerves, the fibromyalgia, tension headache, migraine headache, rheumatoid arthritis, chronic low back pain. All these are painful conditions that are actually responding to TCAs and hence to SSRIs also, okay? It's very important for you to Okay, now, when you're giving a patient with COT, COT is chronic opioid therapy, they might worsen pain in some individuals, and this is called as opioid-induced hyperalgesia. Mind you, this is hyperalgesia, okay? Not allodynia, okay? Now, when you're using, to prevent this, to prevent opioid-induced hyperalgesia, what we do is adding a long-acting compound, like methadone, very important, methadone, or extended-release morphine. So very important key feature, everybody needs to understand this. If you are following through this lecture, you have reached this point when you are understanding about chronic opioid therapy. If you are giving a patient with chronic opioid therapy, do you start with extended release morphine or do you start extended release morphine only when you are about to get uh, opioid induced hyperalgesia? The answer is you start later on. You never start with extended release morphine. Very important to know. So two important catch features from this lecture is in chronic opioid therapy, you always start with uh, strong opioids and you give low dose and you go on hiking up the dose. You always add, the, uh, add a non-opioid to an opioid to decrease the dose of opioid. 
Second important catch feature, you never start with an external release opioid. You always end up choosing an external release opioid when you feel like that opioid was the best choice for this patient, but it's causing some amount of hyperalgesia. So external release morphine needs to be used. Okay. So this is, uh, I've already told you. Now, I always told you that there's a barrier above which you need to start monitoring the patient. Otherwise, you should be very liberal with your opioid therapy, liberal with your entire uh, uh, treatment of uh, relief of suffering of pain. So what is this border above which we need to start being very aware of what we're doing? You have something called as morphine milligram equivalent or MME. So for every one mg of morphine, one mg of hydrocodone is the equivalent dose. It's an equi-analgesic and equi-sedative dose. So if more than 50 MME is there per day, if you're giving more than 50 MME per day, that means either it is 50 mg hydrocodone or 33 mg oxycodone. Then you increase the frequency of follow-up during which you will administer pain questionnaires. You'll administer, you'll check for any side effects. And then you uh, consider uh, offering naloxone. Naloxone is basically an antidote. Okay. You give it with the opioid basically. If you're going per day more than 90 MME, that is 90 mg hydrocodone or 60 mg oxycodone, then you go to a pain medicine specialist. Um, uh, or a specialist referral is required. So 50 m, uh, more than 50 mme, you can start increasing the follow-up and start offering naloxone. More than 90, you go to a specialist. That is called as morphine milligram equivalent. Okay. So this is the all about chronic opioid therapy. Lot of things are there to tell about uh, analgesics and paracetamol and everything. I've jumped to what is not least to talk about, which is chronic opioid therapy. Now, in hearing and touch are the last senses to stop functioning in any patient. So continue talking to the patient, continue touching the patient and, you know, giving him a soothing hand. It always helps relieving him, relieving him of the pain. Okay. Patients also should be uh, instructed to use their rescue medication. Let us say you're giving eight hourly morphine to somebody. Okay. And in the middle, they did some activity that caused increased backache. Okay. They're having backache because of spinal meds. They did some increased activity that made them increase their dose in the middle only. Okay. So instead of eight hourly morphine, they took two mg morphine more during in the middle. Okay. That is called as a rescue dose. But giving this rescue dose does not mean that the next dose should be skipped. So eight hourly will continue. You just increase, you just put that rescue dose in the middle. That's all. It should not change the, or skip the next dose. You should never skip to the next dose. Okay. That is to show how much, how important it is to continue opioid therapy and not be afraid of it. Okay. So uh, like I told you, it is inappropriate to start with extended release preparations. Okay. Never start with extended release preparations. Only start later after two to three days of starting the uh, uh, single, uh, you know, uh, uh, timed uh, doses, you calculate the total dose and then probably you can start extended dose if you have a good follow-up. Okay. So this also I've told you, weak opioids were used first. Uh, the strong opioids like Martin were used in doses later on. But this break between the weak and strong opioid is no longer commonly accepted. Okay. So we, uh, we need to use strong doses also. Okay. Strong opioids and low doses of strong opioid needs to be bought into the picture. Okay. This is what I was talking to you about. This is the last slide. I've told you about being prepared with whatever you're talking about to a patient in palliative care. This is the P spikes protocol. So spike is the mnemonic spikes is the mnemonic and p was added recently if you go to other other places and find out in google you get only spikes it is p spikes first is preparation you need to be prepared of what you are going to speak it is not preparing the family or preparing the patient it is you you need to rehearse the steps you need to document what needs to be communicated and be prepared for what you need to be spoken then you set the stage okay you need to have a good room with good amount of uh, uh, space so that you don't have disturbance now, now and then, then you perceive the patient's actual state. You perceive of where the patient is there. You know, he might be like, uh, you know, coming out from work. You need to make him relax. You need to understand what his financial status is. You need to understand his social status. And most often, you know, whenever you've gone, whenever personally speaking, whenever you have going and giving, uh, you know, counseling to somebody who's sick, you end up talking to the wrong family member. You might, they'll say, yeah, it's, it's my family member, but then they're not the ones who make the decision. So they'll say, okay, wait, I'll call the person who's actually, you know, supposed to take decisions. Then the whole thing has to be repeated. It's going to be time consuming. It's going to be monotonous. You are going to get irritated. So first perceive the patient and understand who's supposed to be spoken to. Gather a lot of people if needs to be. Don't let anybody who's not related to the patient stand there. That, that goes against the patient's uh, rights to information. Then you need to in, uh, know what the patient needs to know. You need to ask if there's supposedly a bad news that's going to come. Are you able to, you know, are you in the position to hear that news? Uh, will you accept it? Should I talk to somebody else or should I talk to you? So you need to invite and you need to know the information needs of the patient. He, he might have just come to know how, how the patient is doing today. 
if you go and tell him no patient is going to die in one or two weeks it's going to cause a lot of havoc so that you need to know what the information needs are okay then you need to know about the knowledge of the condition okay so here uh, after you explain you need to uh, know how much how much they know prior only you might be speaking to a physician you might be speaking to a fellow nurse then you you can't you don't need to be totally in detail about what is happening similarly if you are having a person from the below poverty line someone who is not educated you can't go on explaining in you know technical uh, uh, you know medical jargon about what is happening they're not going to understand and the language that you speak also is very important you need to come down to uh, the language that you speak either hindi kannada tamil or whatever you need to speak to whatever language that they are comfortable in it's better to have a partner or a doctor who knows that language so that you need to know the you need to know the knowledge of the condition then you need to empathize you need to empathize they are obviously going to cry they are obviously going to be shocked you need to empathize you can't be very blunt there and at the most at the end very very important please always summarize very very important that needs to be missed the first and the last step is always missed p and s is missed you never prepare yourself you don't have a mental preparation of what you're going to tell how you're going to tell uh, and you never ask the patient to summarize it is not you summarizing it's very important for the patient to summarize i mean the family members to summarize as to what we have spoken that that you know that that brings out certain flaws or gaps that the patient might have not understood then you go and fill in those gaps that is very very important for you to understand so that is about the p spikes protocol so preparation setting the stage perception of the patient invitation and information needs assessment the knowledge of the entire condition and you speak about the entire thing then you empathize with the response that they give and then you some ask them to summarize or you also can summarize but it's very important for you to ask them to summarize because then you will know what they have thought and how much better you can be in, um, you know prepping your next counseling that's very very important that is called as p spikes so in summary today we have discussed about palliation palliative care and how it is not only about end of life care it is from the beginning itself this is in contrast to hospice care which is only in the end end of life care okay things that you do at the near end okay respite care is not at all related to the patient it is related to the caregivers very very important it is the caregiver burden that needs to come, come down that is called as respite care okay this is very very important for people who are living in a, a current indian society traditional indian society respite care needs to be emphasized okay that's very very important then you need to know how to not prolong the life that is not of any quality you should know what are futile treatments you should know what is qualitative and quantitative futile treatments role of advanced care directives always including you this lecture even you know is even makes sense to people who are listening to this lecture you need to have talk talks about this to your spouse to your parents to your grandparents or your siblings as to what this situation happens what should be done who is your proxy who is supposed to take your decisions if you become non competent to give decisions all these advanced care directives and proxy making needs to be in place and needs to be emphasized palliative sedation don't get scared of palliative sedation palliative sedation if given properly if given correctly they help relieving pain never be scared of increasing the dose never be scared in dosing more than what is generally accepted to be you know enough just giving one paracetamol is not enough you need to know how much paracetamol is required for the patient then what is pain what is the definition of pain what is nociceptor induced inflammation what is primary activation what is secondary activation what are the different mediators this slide is very important for anybody to understand what are the mediators of pain okay so substance p is released from the nerve which causes sensitization it's also called as nociceptor induced inflammation given in harrison so you can go back and read you should know the pathways and how pathway lesions can cause uh, neuropathic pain okay finally we understood there are three mild moderate and uh, severe pain in harrisons but who uh, gives step ladder treatment for four steps and uh, cot therapy which is chronic opioid therapy and what are the nuances in how to start the doses which ones to start which opioids to start whether weak or strong opioids how to uh, you know anticipate that uh, constipation is going to happen and start giving treatment to constipation and at the end uh, at the end of this lecture what i want you to go go uh home with is the fact that palliation begins from diagnosis and you shouldn't be never scared and you should our right and responsibility to relieve pain and let us let us let us understand that uh, death needs to be welcomed with dignity okay let us die of death okay and just not because of lack of imagination so thank you uh, so this is all about today's lecture so the next session we'll be talking about the different types of pain like chest pain abdominal pelvic pain headache and next session will be purely medical and purely algorithm based so